There is an exciting new breakthrough in how we treat cancer. Imagine we could obtain vital information about a patient's tumor from a blood sample. Scientists discovered that as tumors change and their cells die, small pieces of their DNA are released into the bloodstream. These fragments are known as circulating tumor DNA, or ctDNA. So what does this mean? Clinicians will be able to identify mutations or alterations in cancer-related genes using a simple blood test. This allows patients to receive more targeted treatments while also monitoring their response to ongoing treatment. That means less invasive testing, more precise and actionable results, and better patient outcomes. This is only the beginning. For this breakthrough to touch as many lives as possible, we will need a large-scale coordinated effort to prove it works. That is where Friends of Cancer Research is leading the charge, bringing together an unprecedented group of stakeholders to propel this tool to the forefront of cancer medicine. Together, we're understanding how ctDNA aligns with treatment outcomes and how it could revolutionize our approach to patient care and accelerate drug development. And we're just getting started. Good morning, I'm Jeff Allen, President and CEO of Friends of Cancer Research. Thank you for joining us for today's forum to explore the use of circulating tumor DNA as an early endpoint. As you just saw, ctDNA continues to be an exciting research topic and presents numerous different opportunities to enhance drug development and patient care. Over the last several months, we've been very pleased to lead the CT Monitor Project, a unique collaboration to explore whether changes in ctDNA levels are an indicator of clinical benefit. I'm pleased to announce that the results from the Step 1 CT Monitored Lung Cancer Prototype will be formally published in the JCO Precision Oncology Journal in the next few days, so please be on the lookout for that. And Step 2 is well underway and will provide foundational evidence about the use of ctDNA. Please use the QR code at the bottom of the right-hand side of your screen to find out more information on our CT Monitor project as well. The FDA has recently provided a framework through draft guidance describing several use cases for ctDNA in the early disease setting, and today we'll be focusing on its potential role as an endpoint. Specifically, as you've seen in the discussion draft developed with a broad committee of experts, we aim to chart the path for the types of evidence needed to validate the use of ctDNA as an early endpoint. Through careful planning and collaboration, we hope to accelerate the process. To kick off today's meeting, I'm pleased to turn things over to the chair and founder of Friends, Ellen Siegel. Thank you, Jeff. We are very honored to be here with Patrizia Cavazzoni. Dr. Cavazzoni is the director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Cedar at the FDA. Welcome and thank you for speaking with us and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing and we're deeply appreciative of it. With all the attention that accelerated approval received over the past year, can you discuss the importance of this pathway and its use to support drug development moving forward? Well, first of all, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, thank you for having me uh, here today. It, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, speak about this very important topic. Um, it's uh, uh, well established that accelerated approval has enabled access to drugs, in some cases years earlier than waiting for longer term endpoints, such as survival in, in oncology. And uh, accelerated approval is an essential program for oncology and for other disease areas. Um, and because of that, we need to nurture it, we need to protect it, and we need to find ways to expand its use. And there's some examples of how we can do so, uh, such as, for instance, uh, advancing our understanding of the uh, biological underpinnings of diseases and surrogate markers uh, that may serve as endpoints for accelerated approval. We have made great strides in oncology um, and we have uh, still uh, opportunities in oncology and obviously a, a long way to go in other disease areas. Uh, the other ways in which we can continue to advance uh, accelerated approval is by continuing to enhance the program. Uh, for instance, 
by promoting uh, consistent upfront discussions with companies and developers, uh, timely initiation of confirmatory trials, and also um, encouraging trials uh, uh, that are feasible and more generalizable than the trial or trials that led to uh, the accelerated approval. And I cannot emphasize enough the pivotal role of confirmatory studies in accelerated approval, because when we use accelerated approval, um, we inherently acknowledge that there is still some uh, uh, residual uncertainty around uh, uh, the uh, uh, extent of the benefit, the existence of clinical benefit, and so on. And so it's very important that we, uh, um, we have these confirmatory studies and that they are conducted in a timely fashion. And last but, but not least, I want to mention this, la this, this, this point, even if it uh, goes beyond FDA's scope. And uh, what we are seeing uh, is that society and the public are increasingly demanding a solution to the drug cost versus value question. And uh, we have to uh, um, acknowledge this uh, as we uh, continue to, to advance and, and foster the use of, the, of this incredibly important regulatory tool. Well, clearly, access and affordability are really important issues, but we need, as you know, solutions for unmet medical need, and the patient community is really grateful to you for this uh, commitment. Um, Accelerate approval is used extensively in an oncology. We have over 160 oncology therapies uh, that have uh, uh, received this approval. We're incredibly fortunate about it. Um, and why is it used that much in oncology? How can we get this to be used in other areas of unmet medical need? Well, that's a really very important question. And uh, at the risk of uh, stating the obvious, uh, uh, one important reason for uh, the uh, uh, greater utilization of uh, accelerated approval in oncology is that all cancers are serious and life-threatening. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a core sort of requirement for us to be able to uh, utilize accelerated approval. It has to be for a serious and life-threatening uh, condition. Uh, in oncology, uh, we also have uh, direct disease processes uh, like tumor size reduction or delays in progression that can be measured and can be measured uh, quantitatively and objectively. And that is not something that we have in uh, uh, many other disease areas. Uh, um, and, and these types of measures in oncology have been standardized, socialized within the research community over decades and have been correlated with beneficial uh, outcomes. So they have really become part of the fabric of uh, not only research, but also uh, uh, clinical practice. Also in oncology, we have seen uh, recent advances in immune oncology and precision oncology, oncology that have uh, gone hand in hand with uh, um, achieving a much greater understanding of the biological underpinnings of cancer and therefore have led to drug development with unprecedented responses and duration of responses and this has facilitated the utilization of accelerated approval in oncology. And so to the question uh, of how we can utilize accelerated approval, approval to a greater extent in uh, disease areas beyond oncology, well, I would say that we need to learn from the road, road that we have traveled in, in, in cancer to expand the utilization of accelerated approval in other disease areas. And example of tremendous unmet medical need are, for instance, neurodegenerative diseases, um, where uh, we really have uh, to uh, uh, really uh, uh, double down on uh, um, getting to a better understanding of the biology of, of the diseases and uh, to identify um, biological markers that could be 
uh, amenable to be used for, for uh, accelerated approval. Well, thank you. I mean, because it's a great a med medical need and clearly the science has to be there and it has to meet the regulatory standards. But we know that the FDA is really committed to this and it's incredibly important. Um, do you see uh, opportunities for further enhancement of accelerated approval? Would you like to do more with it? I mean, you talked a little bit about the confirmatory trials and other things, but are there other areas that uh, you'd like to explore? You've been a pioneer and have been doing extraordinary work and it would be interesting to see if there are other ways that you know we can use this important mechanism or enhance it yeah very much so and uh, uh, you know the point the first point that i want to uh, uh, raise is actually very germane to uh, uh, the topic of uh, today's conference uh, which is uh, 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 ctdna um, even in areas such as oncology uh, there are still opportunities to identify more endpoints to uh, uh, support drug development and potentially accelerated approval. And when we think about evidence generation to uh, uh, support the utilization of new endpoints, it is really important to distinguish the type of evidence generation that is needed to, val uh, to validate a surrogate endpoint that can actually replace uh, a clinical endpoint, such as, you know, hypertension, uh, replacing uh, uh, stroke, for instance, versus the type of evidence generation that is needed to uh, um, uh, uh, validate a uh, surrogate endpoint that reasonably predicts clinical benefit. And the latter is the type of endpoint that we uh, that underpins or can underpin the utilization of accelerated approval and so these are very important uh, uh, distinct uh, distinctions um, that uh, uh, very often uh, are lost uh, in in discussions about uh, accelerated approval uh, endpoints and it can make a difference when it comes to uh, the type of evidence that needs to be brought to, to bear the uh, um, and the duration of, of, of the validation process and the context uh, within which the evidence uh, are, are generated. Um, the other areas that I think are very important and I've alluded to earlier um, is the uh, 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 really embedding this uh, uh, consistent upfront planning um, and direct interactions with FDA regarding validation of new endpoints and confirmatory trials as early as possible in the development program. The earlier, uh, the better. I mentioned earlier also the importance of uh, the timely initiation and completion of, of confirmatory studies. Um, that is not so much an enhancement, uh, but uh, a, a really a, 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 a practice that needs to really be uh, a routine in uh, uh, are thinking about uh, uh, development programs and, and how we interact uh, uh, with, uh, with, with developers. Um, having said so, I also want to um, point out that um, while this uh, upfront planning is very important and uh, uh, very feasible in, in most circumstances, we also have to uh, take into consideration the fact that um, there will always be those uh, 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 more rare instances where um, FDA may, deter may determine that accelerated approval is the appropriate uh, pathway only as we review the application and we uh, um, uh, observe that the data and the evidence that were generated in, in the development program um, are uh, uh, more uh, are suitable and are supportive of uh, utilizing accelerated approval. And I don't necessarily see those instances are as the uh, uh, norm. Um, however, uh, there will continue to be situations such as uh, such as that one. Today's meeting is focused on evidence to validate the use of changes in circulating tumor DNA as a potential endpoint for accelerated approval. What is the path forward on this and new endpoints? We really appreciate your guidance. 
on this because it's incredibly important to cancer patients. Well, and this is a very important question, um, and uh, we are very interested in uh, identifying and advancing uh, new endpoints that can uh, inform drug development and also have the uh, potential, if the uh, evidence supports it, uh, to be uh, utilized for uh, to, to support uh, uh, accelerated approval. Um, and as you know, Ellen, we have issued guidance uh, on a, a C, a, a CTDNA uh, and the current state of our uh, understanding. Um, the guide, guidance details uh, multiple uses of CTDNA, some of which are are ready for regulatory use now, and others which have the promise of a regulatory use with more evidence generation, such as um, uh, the use uh, of a CTDNA as uh, an endpoint for uh, accelerated approval. Examples of, of current uses uh, uh, include uh, uh, using CTDNA as a, a molecular residual disease to enrich a trial for a high risk or low risk population that may benefit from uh, escalated or de-escalated therapy, for, for instance. Now, when it comes to uh, potential use uh, of CTDNA as an accelerated approval endpoint, we are always open, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, study and uh, uh, understand new endpoints and see the promise for CTDNA for um, uh, further regulatory uses. Uh, however, uh, we do need uh, the data to support the use of CTDNA as an accelerated approval endpoint. Um, and to that effect, uh, we recommend that trials collect appropriate data uh, on CTDNA DNA before and after drug treatment, as well as, as a long-term outcome, uh, so that we can include these trials into our growing body of, of evidence uh, about uh, this uh, promising uh, endpoint. We also encourage companies to come to us and discuss and provide details of uh, any proposed meta-analysis plan to validate the use of CTDNA in a particular context. And uh, uh, I also want to flag that the test itself is also an important component. Um, CTDNA assessment can vary among laboratories and uh, across technologies that are used to detect CTDNA. And so it is really important that we work towards a further standardization of assays that would allow for better use of CTDNA DNA in a regulatory context and will more importantly allow for analysis across studies to validate the use of CTDNA as a potential endpoint and, and uh, expanded regulatory tool. And last but not least, I really want to emphasize the uh, uh, important, importance of collaborative approaches to uh, validate surrogate endpoints across multiple clinical trials. Wow, that is incredibly insightful and important and very informative. I hope those that are working on this will listen carefully and follow your lead and importantly the ability to communicate the plans for validation with the FDA is important. Thank you so much. Thank you for your hard work and thank you for all you're doing and we are very fortunate to have you at this position and um, just deep appreciation for everything you're doing uh, for patients because I know that is your North Star as well as it is for ours. Um, deeply appreciative. And now I turn this back over to Jeff. Thank you very much. As we move forward with our program now, I'd like to turn things over to our first panel of the day to help walk through recent examples for developing early endpoints that can be quite instructive to lead the next discussion, I'd like to introduce Chris Abash from AstraZeneca. Chris? Thank, thank you very much, Jeff, and also thank you, Dr. Cavazzoni, for that excellent introduction to today's meeting. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Abosch. I'm Senior Director in Translational Medicine at AstraZeneca, 
and it's a real privilege to be here today to moderate this um, panel discussion on leveraging learnings from recent endpoint validation studies. So we've already heard that circulating tumor DNA has broad potential as a biomarker uh, with both clinical and regulatory applicability in early stage cancer. And Friends of Cancer have embarked on an ambitious uh, cross-organizational effort to really chart a path forward to develop data sets capable of validating ctDNA as an early endpoint in early stage disease. And this path was outlined in, in detail in, in the organization's white paper that was published at the end of last year. So the purpose of today's panel is really to touch on learnings from validating other early endpoints in early stage disease, such as pathological complete response and minimal residual disease and hematological malignancy with the aim of drawing on the community's experiences that have been gained during development of these endpoints to set the stage for success when it comes to applying ctDNA as a surrogate endpoint. So with that introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce our expert panel for today. We have um, Nicole Gormley uh, from the FDA, who joins us from the Centre for Drug Evaluation and Research. Lala Amiri, who also joins us from the CDER. Angie D. Michel, who joins us from the University of Pennsylvania, where she's professor in breast cancer excellence, and our last panelist, Jeff Oxnard, who joins us from Foundation Medicine. So extend a warm welcome to all our panelists, and we're going to jump straight into the discussion now, as we have lots of questions. So the, the first question, we, we've heard that granting accelerated approval can be based on a surrogate endpoint that's reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Could I possibly ask Nicole for her thoughts um, around the distinction between an early endpoint and a surrogate endpoint? Yes, thanks Chris um, for the um, question. It's lovely to be here. Um, so just a few comments, you know, we use three terms when we um, are talking about potential endpoints. Um, the first being um, either an early or intermediate clinical endpoint, um, the second, a surrogate reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And then lastly, just the term surrogate. Um, and, you know, the first two endpoints can be used to support accelerated approval, with the last, you know, surrogates really just being used uh, for regular approval. Um, and there are distinctions between these and oftentimes a lot of confusion around these terms. Um, you know, an intermediate or early clinical endpoint is just as, as it says. It's an endpoint that can be collected earlier. Um, than a long-term endpoint like progression-free survival or overall survival. Um, and um, typically, you know, um, this has been used um, in oncology substantially, like in terms of response rate is a typical one that we've seen. Um, a surrogate endpoint um, is one that's been fully validated and uh, there's sufficient uh, evidence that the treatment effect on the surrogate would capture the full effect of treatment on the clinical endpoint such that you really don't need to know the outcome on the, on the clinical endpoint of interest uh, because you know the effect on the surrogate. Um, so in that setting, that's why this can be used for regular approval and not accelerated approval where you require uh, confirmatory um, evidence of benefit. Um, and then an intermediate uh, or a, a surrogate endpoint that's reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, there's still you know, information and data you know, to support its use. And we think that it's likely a surrogate, but uh, there's less confidence there. Um, so really early endpoints, intermediate endpoints, or you know, uh, surrogates reasonably likely are used for accelerated approval, but there's still some uncertainty in, in these cases when it's used. Um, and so often there's a requirement um, that there are confirmatory trials conducted later on to verify the clinical benefit that we suspect. So hopefully that adds a little clarity to some of the terminology that we use uh, surrounding these endpoints. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. I think that was, that was very clear and it, it certainly explained things to me. Um, so, so having discussed what we mean by, by early endpoints, I'd like to turn it to um, Jeff to ask his opinion regarding how the use of early yeah, endpoints have impacted drug development in, in oncology. Thanks, Chris. I, I see patients uh, at Boston Medical Center, right? I, I see a patient who has tumor testing and finds a mutation, and I can start them on a pill and get a, an amazing response within months that can last then for years. Actually, there's a great dif distinction for that patient about an early endpoint that I see so, so quickly and a surrogate endpoint that will happen perhaps years later. Think about that for drug development, right? When those dr drugs were in clinical trials, we're seeing that early signal, it's exciting, 
And yet we might have to wait years to get that final endpoint for full approval. So that's that distinction for a given patient on a given trial about the ability to approve a drug months in on that early endpoint as opposed to waiting years. And so what's happened now is that these targeted therapies we're using in lung cancer, EGFR, ALK, RET, MET, have been getting accelerated approval sometimes years before the, the full endpoint is available for confirmatory approval. And that creates access to these sick cancer patients. Patients who now can get a hold of a drug that would otherwise be entirely investigational. Patients, patients can get commercial access to these therapies anywhere in the US and start using them, start benefiting with the anticipation of a confirmatory approval happening down the line. Uh, and, and that's the element that of course, we're very vigilant about to make sure that that con confirmation actually happens. And that this isn't just lung cancer, it's now across advanced oncology. There are many cancer patients who have benefited from this transformation. Uh, and what I think we're talking about today is how we take this clearly potent learning from advanced cancer patients and apply it to this new challenging opportunity of impacting access to these therapies for earlier curable cancer patients. And thank you, Jeff. I, I completely agree. Um, when, it, when it comes to individual patients, having the ability to access these medications early when they're showing, showing such strong responses in these early endpoints is, is really um, key. So, so in addition to PCR, uh, pathological complete response, um, min, sorry, um, one, one. And so in the past decade, we've seen a couple of early endpoints emerge in oncology drug development. So one of which is pathological complete response in breast cancer. So could I, I turn the question to Angie and ask for an overview of how PCR emerged as an endpoint in breast cancer and ask her to highlight any challenges and, and key learnings that are, occurred. Thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, this is, a, it's been a really incredible story in breast cancer. Uh, really dating back to the late 90s, early 2000s and the NSABP B27 trial that essentially looked at whether we could use chemotherapy in a neoadjuvant setting uh, and whether that was equivalent to that same chemotherapy given adjuvantly. That trial resulted in um, a finding that in fact, whether you use the chemotherapy prior to surgery or after surgery in the early stage setting, you would get the same result. But if you used it prior to surgery, you would be able to see how responsive the tumor was. And if in fact, at the time of surgery, there was no tumor left within the breast or lymph nodes, that patient had an exceptional long-term outcome compared to patients who had residual disease. So that was really the birth of pathologic complete response as a biomarker, a, a real biomarker that could be used in managing patients with early breast cancer. I think that we learned a lot in trying then to um, take that, uh, that endpoint to drug development. I'm one of the um, uh, principal investigators on the iSpy2 trial, which is a large platform trial in which we are assessing new drugs and using pathologic complete response as an early endpoint to identify active agents. I think what we found over the course of the almost two decades that we've been evaluating this endpoint is early on, there was a lot of focus on testing drugs to see if they would improve pathologic complete response rate, but not powering the trials to ultimately be able to then link those early results to an outcome of interest. And so we saw lots of results about drugs or regimens that would improve PCR, but we then could not go on to link that to an improvement in event-free survival. Another thing we learned was that we needed to harmonize our definitions for what we would call a path CR. And there were a lot of definitions used, different definitions used in the early trials. So when we went to do meta-analyses to try to really understand the key relationship between path CR and event-free survival, we had all kinds of different definitions of path CR, and it was very difficult to look at these trials in aggregate. We also came to realize that if patients received additional therapy in the adjuvant setting after the measurement of path CR, but before the ultimate endpoint, EFS, that would modify the relationship between path CR and EFS. And that became a major issue in that that would confound the results that we would see. So I think that what we ultimately realized is 
we needed to really come together as a group to define PACCR uh, and how we would measure it to generate uh, trial designs that would incorporate uh, long-term endpoints and be powered for those long-term endpoints, as well as the confirmatory trials with those endpoints that would be necessary to go from accelerated to full approval for various drugs. And I think we have seen success there, particularly with regard to the Keynote 522 data with pembrolizumab uh, that did confirm findings from ISPY2 and other early trials uh, showing an improved path CR rate to the use of pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant setting, and that has led to the approval of that drug uh, for early breast cancer and triple negative disease. So, yeah, thank you, Angie, for those um, interesting perspectives on this. I, I think there's certainly a lot of learnings we we can take from that to and and apply to circulating tumor DNA. Um, so, so I'd like to run the next question by by our regulatory colleagues on the panel. So we, we've heard about pathological complete response. Another um, early endpoint is minimal residual disease in, in hematological malignancy, and that this has been used in some blood cancers. From an FDA perspective, what, what types of data provided confidence in the use of PCR and, and MRD for regulatory decision making? And perhaps we, we could start with um, Lala and then move to um, Nicole to answer this. Sure, happy to do that. I can comment on the PCR and Nicole can comment on the MRD. Um, so as we just heard, uh, we had actually um, um, numerous trials conducted in breast cancer that had used PCR as um, one of their endpoints. And there was a great interest that um, was um, recognized that for the use of PCR for a regulatory approval, and for that, actually, um, FDA has started doing its own project in collaboration with multiple other, um, actually, academic uh, centers and pulled, the, pulled several trials and looked at the correlation of PCR and long-term outcome and compared several definitions of the PCR and published, um, actually, the findings at the same time, uh, held several public discussions um, and um, published uh, draft guidance for the use of PCR for uh, actually um, getting a rec basically a, um, exterior approval for high-risk early breast cancer patients. And um, there was an application that was submitted for review, which uh, the data was very um, uh, sort of supportive for the approval. Um, it was discussed at, at an advisory committee meeting. Uh, it, the data was supported with a large magnitude of overall survival improvement from the metastatic trials. So um, when it was discussed, um, the FDA review team and as well as the experts on the ODAC all actually uh, felt that um, basically the application could be approved and um, that was the first uh, basically approval. So uh, we actually, there were several steps that went into this process. And um, I think since then we've learned a lot uh, about the challenges of the use of PCR. And as Dr. DeMichel mentioned some of those, and we have actually updated this guide, our guidance based um, upon our learnings and um, the, this particular guidance is only written for breast cancer, but I let Nicole to comment on the use of MRD that is actually um, a sort of written for multiple uh, hematological malignancies. Nicole? Yeah, thanks. And, you know, just to highlight, you know, within um, the guidance that we um, put out on um, use of MRD and heme malignancies, you know, um, this does cover multiple diseases and um, we, there are unique aspects and considerations for each disease, you know, and its use of MRD. Um, and so we call that out in the guidance and, and, and put forth some various considerations. Um, each, you know, the heme malignancies are in a little bit of a different place with their use of um, MRD. Um, for example, there's a lot of experience with uh, use in ALL. Um, and um, and I, the example that comes to mind is of uh, blenitumumab, um, where um, there's actually an indication for use um, in, of uh, blenitumumab in patients that are MRD positive. And this was supported by um, patient level historical data that was submitted to the agency. 
uh, that allowed us to assess the acceptability of the threshold to define a population at high risk for relapse. Um, so uh, to define, you know, the, the uh, risk for the indicated patient population and if that was acceptable. And then also an acceptable amount of MRD, you know, decrease that would be indicative of clinical benefit. Um, so um, that's, that's one example. Um, there's also ongoing efforts in various diseases to conduct meta-analyses looking at um, MRD and its, you know, uh, relationship to clinical benefit. Um, and looking at things such as what's the appropriate threshold for MRD negativity that best correlates with clinical benefit, the timing of assessments, uh, whether or not sustained MRD is needed, um, such that, you know, not just assessing it at one time point, but at multiple time points. Um, and then also, you know, um, efforts as well, looking at what we would call a surrogate threshold effect, which is the minimum treatment effect on the surrogate endpoint that's needed to predict an effect on a true clinical endpoint. Um, and so there's lots of ongoing efforts and, and pooling of this data uh, is really essential such that it allows us to understand how to best use it in future clinical trials. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. So, so there have also been efforts to expand pathological complete response into other tumour types, including lung cancer. I wonder if uh, Jeff could comment on the status of these efforts and, and the, the challenges that, that have been encountered using PCR in different tumour types. Yeah, sure. I mean, in lung cancer, there's been enthusiasm about PATCR for a long time. I remember writing papers about this over a decade ago at MSKCC, where I trained. Um, but what's happened is there's not been as much adoption of the neoadjuvant paradigm. There's not been as much evidence generated. And so here's what happened. This year, we have our first FDA-approved immunotherapy for the neoadjuvant treatment of, of non-small cell lung cancer. Changes care. And then actually, while that was approved a month or two ago, the PATCR data about that trial was available more than a year prior. And yet when that data come out, it was exciting, clear, measurable increase in PATCR rates. And, and it certainly caused a lot of scientific buzz and a lot of medical enthusiasm. But PATCR at that time point had not been qualified as an early endpoint for lung cancer. And it's not because of lack of enthusiasm. It's simply that the, the sort of systematic evidence build we just heard about in breast cancer hadn't been done in lung cancer, perhaps because of not enough data, not enough trials to bring together to a meta-analysis. And so, you know, the, the endpoint comes out, the trial's positive, and yet a year goes by before we can actually get this approved and accessed by patients because we need an endpoint we can have confidence in. And so I think that the enthusiasm is still there in lung cancer and in other places to use PATCR, but, but that scientific enthusiasm isn't enough. We need to get organized and we need to build out the evidence so that when the time is right, we can act on these early endpoints. And I think that's a lesson as we embark upon this for CTDNA, how can we be organized to make sure we can deliver on this opportunity for patients? Yeah, great points, thank you. So, so to close out, uh, as we continue to consider how to clinically validate circulating tumor DNA as an early endpoint, I think we've heard it would be critical to align on the necessary data to generate an evidence base to support its use. So I'd, I'd like to ask both Angie and, and then perhaps Nicole for their thoughts on how we can work as a community to leverage trial data to support a, a CTDNA early endpoint. Yeah, thank you. I, I think there is tremendous enthusiasm for this in the breast cancer field as well as in others. I think what we uh, can take away from our previous experience is that we need to do the foundational work. That means understanding how the biomarker, the CTDNA biomarker functions within particular disease types, what influences in particular populations, what the false positive and false negative rates are, and to really design trials that are going to enable us to uh, estimate effect sizes uh, so that when we go to do the definitive phase three trial, uh, we'll have the power to really be able to validate this endpoint uh, along with the long-term endpoint. And I think once we do that, then we will have the opportunity for accelerated approval of new drugs utilizing this biomarker just as we did for PATCR. But I think phase two trials where we generate all of this type of foundational data and coming together as a cancer community to define what those phase two trials look like and what kinds of data we need to generate would go a long way toward really being able to combine forces and bring this technology to our field much faster than if we're not working together and doing it in a more piecemeal fashion.
Thanks, and I would Jeff. just add, um, there's two things that we really look at, you know, when we're thinking about whether or not an endpoint can be used um, for to support a, approval action for a product. Um, and the first is, you know, if it's an assay based endpoint, uh, is the has the assay been analytically validated? Um, and that's, you know, um, a separate characterization, um, looking just at those um, factors that um, Angie mentioned, um, you know, the sensitivity of the assay, specificity, performance characteristics, et cetera. Um, and then there's also clinical validity. Does the endpoint allow us to predict the end clinical endpoint of interest? Um, and, and those are two separate evaluations. Um, and, and just to underscore what's been said, it's, it's so paramount um, that when we go to do that clinical validation, um, that there's harmonization where possible, um, such that you know, we can have a um, consistent you know, collection of information, um, consistent use of the assay you know, in various trials, et cetera, such that when we go to pool the data later and, and, and assess its clinical validity, um, there's standard information there that can be um, adequately compared and evaluated. Thank you very much, Nicole. So I think we're coming to the end of our, our session time now. So to finish up the session, I'd, I'd just first of all, obviously like to thank the panelists for the insights they shared with us today regarding this, this complex topic. But I'd also like to take the opportunity to extend my, my thanks to friends for their leadership on this effort to define a clear path forward to validate ctDNA as an early endpoint in early stage disease. Um, ultimately, I think this will drive more efficient and precise drug developments and help patients to gain access to the best treatment strategies early. And, and it's clear that the collaborative spirit that, that Friends and Genders is, is giving us the, the best position to succeed with this endeavour. So with that said, it's, it's my pleasure to turn this back to, to Jeff um, for continuation of the session. Great, thank you, Chris. And thanks to the panel for a great discussion. Building on their insights, I'd like to introduce the final session of today's meeting uh, to help lay out the evidentiary needs and strategies to validate the use of ctDNA as an early endpoint in oncology drug development. As a reminder, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom tab to submit questions to the panel. Leading this panel discussion, I'd like to introduce Gary Pastano from Biodesix. Gary? Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the first panel for a robust discussion. Uh, Chris, great job leading. And thank you as well to the Friends of Cancer Research team for all of support. First off, uh, welcome to panel two. We're gonna be focusing now more on additional evidence uh, to build a roadmap to validate the use of this exciting biomarker ctDNA as an early endpoint for oncology drug development. As Jeff um, announced, myself, I'm the Chief Development Officer at Biodesix, and I'd like to introduce the panel in turn, uh, Julia Beaver, who is the Chief of Medical Oncology at FDA, Eric Blomquist, leading statistician at also at FDA, Mary Savage at GSK. Welcome, Mary, Senior Director of the Companion Diagnostics uh, Program at GSK. Adele Chowdhury. Dr. Chowdhury is a research assistant professor at WashU, uh, multiple uh, disciplines. And finally, Alan Silk at Tempus, Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs. So welcome to the session. And in the interest of time, we've got lots to discuss. I'll open with um, a fairly broad question. Hopefully we can get through these and save some time for additional um, audience questions. But let's start with um, what is the current state of the science behind the use of ctDNA as an endpoint? As I said, it's, it's a large question, so maybe two perspectives, starting Adele um, with yourself and then maybe Julia, clinical and regulatory perspectives. Absolutely. So, I mean, um... It's, it's a great question. It indeed is a broad question, and, and it's an exciting question because, um, I mean, ctDNA is being used in, you know, has so much clinical potential. As, as we discussed in the previous panel, um, you know, we're thinking of ctDNA kind of across the entire clinical spectrum from early detection to MRD detection, early response monitoring, and resistance mutation detection and, and, you know, querying actual mutations, that's already something that we're doing in the clinic. Um, now, regarding the science, there are different features of cell-free DNA, and that's what one thing that makes it such a powerful biomarker is that 
you know, oftentimes, you know, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a physician scientist. I'm, you know, I also have my clinician hat on oftentimes, you know, I'm used to biomarkers in the clinic that are either positive or negative, high or low, certain number versus, you know, a certain different number. The thing about cell-free DNA that I really appreciate is the oncogenomic information we also get. Now we, we don't, you know, for simplicity's sake, sometimes when we are putting together you know, assays for, for research and development or, or commercial assays, sometimes we will sweep some of that under the rug. But from a research setting, what I love is really being able to delve into the genomics and the epigenomics of cell-free DNA. What are the mutations that we are detecting genomically? What are the rearrangements we're detecting? What are the methylation changes we're detecting? What is going on epigenomically within cell-free DNA? What about fragment sizes? Why are these fragment sizes different? And how does that correlate with nucleosomal positioning and what gene expression programs are on versus off? And also, where does the cell-free DNA live? Is it free-floating or is it within exosomes? Now, these are exciting questions. They, you know, they are scientific questions, but they have enormous clinical, you know, potential and they have enormous, uh, you know, roles in also how we think of ctDNA as a biomarker, both a predictive and a prognostic biomarker. Thanks, Adele. Uh, Julia, a uh, regulatory perspective on ctDNA and science, where it is? Sure. Um, so from a regulatory standpoint, uh, we are most commonly seeing ctDNA being used as a selection marker for clinical trials, mainly in the metastatic setting. Um, and in this space, we have approved multiple companion diagnostics for ctDNA use as being essential for the safe and effective use of that corresponding drug. Um, but as mentioned earlier in the program, uh, FDA has also written a draft guidance to industry on the use of ctDNA in the early stage cancer setting, namely the neoadjuvant adjuvant um, setting, which details multiple potential regulatory uses um, for ctDNA, which include um, using ctDNA to detect a certain targetable alteration, enriching a high or low risk population for study in a trial, reflecting a patient's response to treatment uh, or potentially as that early marker of efficacy. And um, we're already seeing and encouraging the use of ctDNA as an enrichment marker for determining molecular residual disease. And as discussed a bit earlier, while the current evidence, which is mainly showing prognostic benefit of um, ctDNA is not yet supported, supportive for regulatory use of ctDNA as an endpoint to predict clinical benefit and primarily support a drug approval. We're really excited to be involved in uh, all the efforts towards this end. Um, and, and the guidance also details this need for further generation of information to support the use of ctDNA as an approval endpoint. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Adele. I think it's important from the audience uh, perspective that maybe we dig a little bit deeper into ctDNA in early disease. And, and as you've mentioned, Julia, just now and previously in the panel, lots of evidence um, from, from the metastatic setting um, and lots of evidence, obviously, from, um, from lung cancer and, and breast cancer. How can we, or, or what sorts of evidence uh, can we translate from the learnings in the metastatic setting as we now turn attention with the guidance to ctDNA in, in early disease, and maybe the next two questions, um, we'll, we'll focus on this a little bit more. So maybe Adele and, and then Mary, maybe your perspectives, sorry, again, on, on this question, ctDNA, early disease, what can we learn from the metastatic setting? Yeah, and, and you know, that's a great question as well. Um, so ctDNA, uh, you know, is present in a higher abundance in the metastatic setting than in the early stage setting. So much of, you know, when you look historically at the field, we have learned about ctDNA from metastatic disease, and then we have adapted some of that, some of our insights to earlier stages, and we're continuing to do that. And um, so I think, I think that's a poignant way to think about it is that, you know, genomically what is occurring in metastatic cancer is 
is, is, is occurring also, kind of simplistically saying it's, it's occurring in a similar fashion within the microcosm of early stage disease. So as we detect alterations in metastatic disease, as we harmonize our efforts across assay types in metastatic disease, we should be able to use that as a framework for doing something similar in earlier stages of disease. So for example, in the current FRIENDS effort of harmonizing uh, across assays for immunotherapy response assessment for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, you can imagine that sort of framework being applied to MRD detection after uh, definitive intent treatment of localized disease, or even in the, in the longer term future, to early cancer detection in, you know, perhaps even more of a screening setting if we let ourselves really, you know, you know, think above and beyond as to where that where we are going with this field. So indeed, that's how I see it. Just like how we learned about ctDNA in earlier stages from metastatic disease, and you know, presumably in, you know, some of the really early seminal work in metastatic breast cancer in the early New England Journal of Medicine paper that was published in 2011 by Dawson and colleagues. I mean, we learned so much from those studies and we applied that to these earlier stages of disease. I see the same thing happening with these harmonization efforts. Mary, comments? Yeah, thanks. And, and just to build on what Adele said, I think um, and agree that despite the different settings, um, metastatic, uh, what we've learned from metastatic treatment trials can provide some lessons learned for the earlier stage. And again, as touched upon, uh, the clinical metrics on the higher concentrations of ctDNA, uh, you make it a good place to start. Um, I mean, I think you know some of the uh, common parameters that um, that will be uh, relevant include uh, some of the pre-analytical methods that are are in use and that have been extensively uh, characterized, um, yeah, namely in some of the blood pack work of uh, Defebo et al. Um, and these pre-analytical methods are really key to ensure ctDNA stability and also to prevent the release of DNA from white blood cells uh, in the blood uh, uh, to help control for, for CHIP. Um, I think some of the things that may be a little bit more difficult to back translate um, include things like collection time points, um, which depending upon um, you know, the stage of, 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 the, of the subject, um, and, you know, for example, the treatment um, modality that's used, um, co collection time, point, time points may need to differ. Um, I think, you know, uh, further and was, was mentioned, um, the uh, assay platforms that are used. Um, there have been um, several uh, ctDNA assay platforms, both tumor-informed fixed content platforms, um, both genetic and epigenetic markers, um, and then different platforms within that. Um, the units of reporting that are used and have been used, um, again, um, you know, there's detected, not detected. Um, there are things like and more continuous variables, which you know maybe uh, end up being more critical to linking the um, ctDNA level to uh, tumor metrics or patient response metrics. So some of these things we can certainly learn um, in the context of the metastatic disease um, and also the on-treatment early, um, uh, early stage diseases as well. Um, you know, again, the question of whether, um, you know, uh, detected, not detected versus a more continuous variable, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll learn these um, as, as the um, assay platforms and, and data come out, but continuing to collect absolute uh, variables uh, as well as the, um, the, the uh, more detected, not detected that may play uh, an important role in metastatic disease when it comes to things like complete response or in the early stage disease when it becomes, you know, um, you know uh, 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 detecting the tumor for, for the very first time. And then finally, well, Keep going, Mary. Yeah, and then just finally, you know, the, the clinical validation and alignment between the ctDNA and the tumor volume will obviously play critical important roles at both stages of disease, um, regardless. Great. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank both Mary and Adele for, for responses here.
So we've heard a little bit about clinical considerations and technology considerations, pre-analytic. Maybe another perspective, Eric, uh, we can turn to you, is on statistical alignment. Uh, what, what can we learn? Um, where might there be leverage from what we've done in late stage for early stage? What can be unique um, about the early stage, if you can comment? Sure. And thanks for the comment, Gary. Um, I guess uh, statistically, there, there's two things that really come into mind as we learn, let's say, ctDNA as a as a surrogate endpoint here. And one is, as we try to prove that this can act as a marker, it's really necessary in, let's say, early stage disease to collect not only the ctDNA data, but as well as the more traditional data, let's say, based upon recurrence, those imaging scans. Um, from other disease areas, what comes to mind as prostate is if patients have knowledge of, let's say, some marker that they think is more prognostic of the disease, uh, we can sometimes miss those, those follow-up scans. And I think it's necessary to, to ensure patients continue to see those scans even early on if there is, let's say, informative sensoring, what's it called, so that knowledge of the earlier endpoint changes how we see the later endpoint, that can become a difficult problem later on to assess. So ensuring that we do receive both types of endpoints within the trial is something that I think all trials should really strive for and really help as we move towards this effort. So that's one thing that comes into mind. And the second is, is the need for pre-specification. So, you know, um, pre-planning these analyses, um, trials moving forwards, you know, retrospective looks at CT and DNA are often difficult to disentangle for the agency. So as much as we can to pre-specify these meta-analyses and these types of approaches, so that as we do start to validate the CT DNA as an early endpoint, we have assurances those. So I think statisticians have a large role to play in this effort early discussions with agencies as well as Friends of Cancer Research will go a long way to ensure that these trials are establishing ctDNA. It, it, it could go either way. Um, you know, it could work out as a circuit network and it could not, but let's ensure that we have the best of data going forward to answer that question in a few years. Maybe a little expansion, Eric, as well, on um, commenting on patient level uh, data versus trial level data, and, and how do you see that playing into, again, you know, an early endpoint? Sure. Kind of so, so without getting too too technical here, there's sort of two types of correlation we see. So, patient level correlation for the ctDNA versus, let's say, a long-term recurrence endpoint, as well as trial level correlation. Um, Patient level would say for patients who tend to have ctDNA, let's say at lower levels, their recurrence goes longer. Trial level correlation would say if we see an effect on a ctDNA endpoint within a trial, we would also expect to see that say a, a, a somewhat uh, similar effect on the longer term endpoints. Really the trial level correlation is a necessary step and as well as patient correlation um, and to see that trial level correlation, what you need is you need a collection of, you know, five to six, you know, preferably 10 pre-planned ca cancer studies in this area where you're able to see that nice correlation between the two. And I think that's where Friends of Cancer Research is really excelling here because they are able to bring many stakeholders to this area, let's say disparate studies, different patient populations, and by doing that, by harmonizing the, the entry criteria, we are able to answer that question about does, let's say, ctDNA as an early endpoint predict this here? And so that's why I want to applaud the, the Friends of Cancer Research on some of their efforts, because it's a really necessary step to, to get that type of information. Thanks, Eric. Um, maybe in addition to um, some of the statistical considerations, what might be some of the other um, key considerations when developing a framework for evidence and in designing trials that could include integration of ctDNA? And maybe for an, an additional perspective, um, Alan and, and then Mary, maybe you can tackle this one. Um, so these considerations obviously could include disease, therapeutic technology specific considerations. Um, Alan, maybe start with you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I think one of the themes that I've been 
trying to pick out from the meeting today is that there's really tremendous promise from CTDNA, but there are still a lot of open questions. And so I think we have to set up evidence generation, try to answer, first identify those questions and then really answer them. And as we just heard from Eric, you know, one consideration is that evidence is gonna come from multiple trials, maybe different tumor types. And we've been hearing about different assays as well and assay technology. So I think the framework really should be portable in the sense that it can apply to and account for evidence that's coming from a broad diversity of trials and assay technologies. And then I also think that it's going to be important um, to be you know, reasonably comprehensive in collecting information for analysis, because there are certain pieces of evidence that I think we can know a priori are going to be important, but there are other ones, other factors that are, are just hard to predict in advance of their impact to the evaluation of CTDNA this way. So that there's going to be, there's going to be a balance that we're going to have to strike there in terms of kind of being still practical, but also collecting information so that we, you know, so that we have everything we need. And then I think another important point is that the, the evidence needs for this may change over time. So however evidence is collected, that, that framework should be adaptable um, based on incoming evidence and then input from stakeholders. And I can see a couple of ways to do this. One might be to take a kind of pre-planned stepwise approach, either to do some kind of exploratory information collecting across a broad diversity of trials and then focusing down on those areas where there's best potential for near-term application of the information or Conversely, you can think of uh, initially focusing evidence generation on the most promising cases um, where you can efficiently generate uh, information for additional analysis and then broadening out to demonstrate generalizability. So I, I just think this is gonna be something important to think through. And then just quickly, my final point is that the agency has really been able to effectively and appropriately apply regulatory flexibility in a lot of different ways. And this is another way they might be able to do that. Um, because I think it's it's important to keep in mind that, that it's possible that the same information may not be needed for each case where CTDNA might be able to support regulatory decision-making as an early endpoint. And so I think that just speaks to the value of this ongoing engagement with an input from FDA. Terrific, Alan. I think this is also what, you know, one of the things that makes CTDNA so appealing is the potential to go across um, disease settings, the potential to go across uh, cancer type. Um, maybe Mary, from the drug development perspective, we've got a lot of focus on immuno-oncology and on targeted therapies. Are there considerations from the drug development side that, that could also let, lend itself to a framework in, in our thought process here? Yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity. You know, I think the framework, uh, again, because especially when we think about this in the early disease setting, um, you know, and even for genetic selection based on mutation, a companion diagnostic, um, you know, really needs, uh, you know, a lot of scrutiny and a lot of uh, standardized methodologies uh, to be fit uh, to be a patient selection marker. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work that, you know, um, Friends of Cancer Research, you know, along with other consortia um, and facilitated by Friends of Cancer Research is put forward uh, assay development uh, metrics and standards for fitness um, that will, will help, um, you know, advance the, the assays to, to be uh, considered a regulated device as well in this, in this um, setting. Um, in terms of the different uh, drug treatment modalities, you know, this is really going to, um, and as um, actually has been very nicely summarized uh, earlier this year um, in the manuscript by Sanz Garcia, you know, the sampling, uh, on treatment sampling that we may do, um, you know, in the, in the context of different treatment modalities uh, may, may be quite different. Um, I'm not sure that we can say at this time that we have standard frameworks for sampling across different treatment modalities. But I think, you know, certainly learn, taking learnings from surgery, um, you know, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, radiotherapy, and just the different modalities, I think, you know, can we build on that um, and, and 
potentially include, at least include some time points in there that would be relevant for the delta ctDNA as we may see with each one of those different treatment modalities. And also what we already know from the impact of those on uh, changes in tumor volume and and patient outcomes. So so I think you know we we do have some frameworks. Some of them are maybe uh, more uh, sturdy than, than others, but but building and and iterating uh, around those those um, modalities is is uh, is important. Great, thank you for perspective, both Alan and Mary. And for the next question, maybe this is um. One of, the, one of the more difficult ones, and I want to turn to Julia for, for comments here. Um, in the early setting, we, we've, you know, we have to think about level of evidence. We've got a, a unique setting where curative um, intervention is possible. When we're considering ctDNA in this specific setting, if you had to look forward, uh, Julia, to companies obviously coming to you, um, what sort of level of evidence might be required in, in this setting? Yeah, I think you hit on a, a key point here, uh, which is that we're talking about the curative adjuvant disease setting. And as such, uh, you know, the overall risk benefit considerations of using a novel endpoint need to factor in the potential harm of uh, resulting in a premature approval. And so really focusing on, on balancing the toxicity of a new therapy with the confidence the endpoint's going to predict actual benefit. And, and thus, I think it's really critical to have strong evidence for use of a novel endpoint like ctDNA in this space. Um, that, that being said, we recognize the imperative here and the unmet need here. Um, and because the adjuvant setting is a potential, you know, is a curative setting, expediting access to novel therapies here would reach arguably the most patients and perhaps have the larger impact on cancer mortality. Thus, the, the imperative is, is definitely there. Um, and in addition, there's a huge potential in the adjuvant setting because these adjuvant trials are um, powered for long-term outcome. They require large, large sample sizes, take a very long time to report out uh, even disease-free survival and certainly overall survival, thus having that earlier um, endpoint earlier than disease-free survival could really cut years uh, off of drug approval. And it's obviously the reason we're here all, all discussing this issue right now. No, very, very exciting. And, and thank you, Julia, for that. Now, in, in the few minutes, what we'd like to do is maybe turn to some of the, the near-term opportunities that this panel sees for advancing our goal of validating ctDNA as a new early endpoint. So really open commentary in it. I'd like to maybe go in order in which uh, we introduce our, our panel here. So maybe starting with Julia. Sure. So this, this theme has been said multiple times and we've been discussing the need for evidence generation. And I really believe that public private partnership efforts just like this led by friends coupled with our FDA guidance, industry collaboration will really be key in trying to standardize the approach to the use of ctDNA um, powering for long-term outcome and really facilitating the ability to collect meaningful data. Um, many of, of those considerations listed in the FRIENDS roadmap, for instance, could be incorporated into industry trials going forward to allow for that potential later pooling. Um, and while the evidence still needs to be generated, we can really put these steps in place now uh, to do this in a manner that sets us up for success in the future. Great. Eric? I mean, I guess is the maybe the, the earliest uh, approach data-wise would be the earliest endpoint we see for early stage breast cancer would be PCR, you know, early data on how that's looking for surgical resection, you know, measuring ctDNA early on, I think would be sort of low hanging fruit to see that relationship. The long-term outcome does take a long time, two, three, four years for that data to read out. It would be nice to start see some data on that early endpoint to see how the, the two are related. Um, otherwise, you know, what what 
uh, Dr. Beaver was saying, pre-planning for those studies to read out so that we do have assurances that if CTNA is to be used as that earlier endpoint, um, we are able to see it with the long term and we can quickly move forward as, as fast as possible on that. Thank you. Great, Mary. Hi, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in the in the early disease setting, um, you know, identifying those subjects that are at the earliest stages of disease um, and, and working, you know, to in very closely with the the um, device provider to 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 sort of push that envelope in the early stage. And, and again, you know, back translating any lessons that we can uh, in the metastatic setting. You know, which should likely extend to um, the behavior of the therapy uh, during the disease. You know, once once the subject has been found ctDNA positive, we can then learn from that metastatic setting the relationship and apply the relationship between the ctDNA level and and the disease progression. Great, and Alan, Alan, if you can add your perspectives, and then we'll go to the questions. Yeah, I can I can add a quick perspective. I mean, I, I just want to air, um, echo what Eric was saying. I completely agree with his perspective. I think pathological complete response is a rapid endpoint. Uh, you have ground truth, you know, tumor tissue to correlate your CTDNA results to. Um, the data in breast cancer is exciting. I think there is potential in other solid tumor malignancies as well. Um, you know, I appreciated the early the earlier discussion we had with with. Dr. Jeff Oxnard regarding potential uses in lung cancer. In my lab, we've looked at CTD and MRD correlated with PATH-CR in colorectal cancer. We have a paper in JCO Precision Oncology from last year in that. Then we have a paper also last year in bladder cancer um, in a special issue that Chris Abosh led of PLOS Medicine where we looked at correlating CTDNA in urine with pathological complete response in bladder cancer patients. So again, those are rapid endpoints. And I think, you know, I would love to see that sort of framework used more as we really generate data quickly rather than waiting. You know, it, it will be, of course, extremely important to wait longer and correlate with progression free survival and overall survival. But, you know, this is an early endpoint that I think we should be looking at more. And then, uh, you know, I think that uh, in addition to kind of gathering of future data, um, you know, there are some basic biological and technical technological considerations around measurement of CTDA that we may be able to get at just with existing data. I mean, we heard from Jeff in the first panel that CTDA is just being used more and more in the clinic today. And so there may be opportunities to just take real world data and uh, compile it and do some analysis there that just identifies uh, useful learnings from moving forwards. Great, and thanks everyone. Um, great discussion. Uh, lots of lots of work to do. Uh, but very exciting um, biomarker. We do have a few questions that came in uh, from the chat, um, and I'd like to extend them now into into our panel. Uh, first question: Why have you focused on ctDNA? And I think this this is more maybe Adele can comment on science and Julia from FDA perspective. Why have you focused on ctDNA primarily rather than other liquid biopsy technologies, of course, such as CTCs, um, cell-free DNA, which I think is where we are uh, focused today, but ctRNA, et cetera? Maybe yeah, Adele. I mean, I, yeah, I can start. I can provide a quick answer. I think, um, I think the reason is just, I mean, the robustness that we've, that we've seen in in the data, um, you know, I, I I still remember. I mean, this has been this has been a few years now, but but in 2017, I had the opportunity to to publish a cancer discovery paper on CTN as an MRD biomarker in lung cancer. It was around the same time that Chris Abosh published, you know, similar results also in early stage lung cancer. Our cohort was more radiation treated. His cohort was more surgically treated, but in both cohorts. CTDNA was an incredibly powerful prognostic biomarker, even when assessed shortly after treatment completion. I remember looking at that data and just, I mean, it was jaw dropping. I mean, I, you know, even, even though I was the one who was leading that study in collaboration with, with my mentors at that time, 
you know, it was just jaw dropping to see that data correlate to the clinical outcomes as strongly as it did. And that, you know, that is now borne out in multiple different malignancies across multiple different studies. And as the assays have gotten more sensitive, the data is just getting even stronger. And I think that's why even though CTA was a late comer to the game relative to, let's say, circulating tumor cells, I think it is in some ways taken over because of just how incredibly correlated it has been to clinical outcomes. No, that's terrific. Um, Julia? Yes, from, you know, from FDA's standpoint, we, we do have engagement, obviously, across many different biomarkers. For instance, CTCs and prostate cancer efforts come to mind. But with respect to CTDNA and perhaps the guidance, we often write um, guidances on areas of interest that we are commonly being asked about by the community or that companies are constantly asking us at their industry meetings. And, and really, that's what spurred our effort um, related to the guidance, because these were questions we were commonly getting um, you know, frequently and, and wanted to have some consensus and, and standardization there. Thank you both. Um, second question, I think um, we'll go to Eric first and then anyone else who cares to comment. A lot of data is emerging that demonstrates correlation between PFS and OS. What is missing? Is the missing piece that we need to develop more granular correlation, such as X value of CTDNA equals X months of PFS OS? Uh, Eric, um, care to start us off? Um. Sure, I, I, I can certainly comment here. Um, so there, I, I think there, there's, it, there's pretty good data that shows that the longer PFS, let's, your longer PFS translates to longer OS on a patient level. Um, we, we know that trial level, I think it's sort of a mixed message. Um, we do know that large magnitudes of PFS season trial tends to somewhat show survival as well. And then that magnitude is always the question I think the missing piece for CTDNA is similar. I think some of the early data coming in is, is if your CTNA levels are staying low, that's probably a good predictor of longer term outcomes. On the trial level data, that's what the necessary piece is. We need to ensure that if we, let's say, I don't know, 20 years down the road, we only look at the CTDNA data, we have assurances that there's also that effect is going to remain for PFS or OS. And that's the missing piece right here is we need multiple trials in one space pre-specified that can demonstrate that trial level correlation between the earlier endpoint and the endpoints that traditionally patients are most concerned with, let's say overall survival, recurrence-free survival. That's the missing piece. It takes time, it is necessary. And we want to ensure that as we wait for doing that, we take all the steps that as that data, as that data comes in, we can answer that question. Great. Are there additional comments? It would be great. We do have another question, um, and, and I do hope we can get, get to it. But are there additional perspectives on this? Great. We'll go to the third question, uh, which I think also um, speaks to the audience interest. Do we, do we need prospective studies to validate CTDNA as a surrogate endpoint, or is retrospective analysis of multiple studies sufficient. We've talked a lot of, today about portability and platforms and so on. Um, I don't know whom in the panel wants to take crack at it. sounds like an FDA type question though. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll certainly take, take a crack at it. I mean traditionally for statistics, retrospective non-pre-specified analysis are very difficult to assess, let's say going forward. Lots of times patients, there is a failed trial uh, a subgroup is used to promote, let's say, positive results. And many times, based upon a prospective trial, that will fail. And we, we constantly have to learn that lesson. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking back at retrospective data. And if it's strongly supportive of this effect, I think it does give good promise going forward to the prospective trials. But I think it does not negate the need for prospective trials in, in this space. And I don't know if others on the panel have to comment. That would be sort of a statistics perspective on it. Yeah, I, I agree, um, Eric. Uh, you know, I think some of it is the answer is it depends. You know, so it depends the studies that um, 
that are brought to us to, to perhaps pool together? Are, were those done in a manner that we've been talking about today where things are standardized and we're able to pool more, more readily? Um, so I think some of, it, some of it may depend, but ultimately prospective trials are, are preferred. Great, question, question four from the audience. On the use of ctDNA as a composite endpoint, is it possible that ctDNA and rhesus responses measure somewhat independent tumor biologic phenomena? Example, tumor volume versus rate of proliferation, cell death. And here's the question, any thoughts on combining ctDNA and early, early radiographic response assessments for a more predictive composite endpoint? I think it's, it's a great question. I can take a quick, I can uh, give a quick answer and then defer to Thank others. Um, so, I mean, so one way that I've thought about this practically is that, you know, imaging, you know, for the majority of solid tumor malignancies, imaging isn't going to be going anywhere. I mean, we, you know, I treat lung cancer in my clinic and I, I view CT scans regularly to assess responses. Even with ctDNA, when ctDNA is layered into my clinical practice in the future, I, you know, I, I don't see it replacing CT scans. We'll be looking at both. So I think whether it's being formally integrated or informally integrated, it will be integrated, meaning that it could be as simple as a clinician like myself looking at both results and trying to make an assessment as to whether the patient is responding or not or maybe we can do some formal integration. I do think that there is some orthogonality in the metrics. I mean, one is a macroscopic imaging modality is macroscopic, you get anatomical information and ctDNA is, is a molecular assay and you get molecular information and you get genomic information. I, I definitely see the two fitting in and we may be able to formally integrate them. And there are other aspects of imaging too that are quite exciting. There's functional imaging where we can look, by, for example, by PET CT scan to see not only where the tumor is, but is it metabolically active? You can imagine integrating that with features of ctDNA for composite biomarkers. I think we have a question um, from our panels. Um, anyone in panel one feel, yeah, you've got a perspective. I think it'd be great. Maybe Angela, if you wanted. Great. Um, I think Angela. Um, go ahead. Sorry about that. Just was on mute. I think I just wanted to um, build on that on that last point that there is going to be a role for the complementary effects of ctDNA and imaging, and we're seeing already in the neoadjuvant setting in breast cancer that while there's a high correlation between clearance of ctDNA and ultimate pathologic complete response, there are patients who clear who who have a pathologic complete response, but don't clear their ctDNA. And we suspect biologically that these may be the patients who do relapse later, particularly in sanctuary sites like the CNS. So I think that um, while utilizing these, you know, to validate each other, there's also a complementarity that we need to be aware of and that ctDNA may actually be able to tell us something biologically above and beyond an imaging response uh, that's incredibly important in identifying a group of patients in whom our therapies are not effective. I think that's a terrific ad, um, Angela, and, and obviously we're very excited uh, to continue to work here on, on exploring ctDNA in, in all of the various settings and in combination with various uh, modalities, imaging and otherwise. So at this time, I'd like to to thank the panel that participated here with me in the second uh, discussion, as well as acknowledge, obviously, the great discussion in panel one and our introductory keynote speakers. So at this time, Jeff, I'd like to turn it over to you. And thank you um, to Frenzy Cancer Research for putting this forum together. Test Developers Pharma, we're all um, interested, excited, as I know FDA is, to see these things um, come forward. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. I'd like to thank all of our panelists today, and a special thanks to the many working group members and our team at Friends that helped develop the discussion draft for today's meeting. 
We hope it will help lay out key considerations and requirements as we look to accelerate the validation of ctDNA as an early endpoint. As I mentioned earlier, stay tuned for the published results of the CT Monitor Step 1 IO Treated Lung Cancer Multi Trial Aggregated Data. Also, updates on CT Monitor Step 2 and other drug classes will be available in the coming months. And importantly, please mark your calendars for November 17th when we aim to bring our annual meeting back to include an in-person format. So thanks very much for joining us today. Take care.